So it's really, really, really awesome to see so many of you here. I've been to conferences, I've been to Vardin events, and I think this is the largest crowd of Vardin users that I've ever seen in one room. So really, really awesome. <laughs> My name is Leif. I, I have this kind of weird way of looking at things. Uh, when I think about kind of how time passes, I think about it in terms of VOD inversions. So as an example, uh, we got VOD in 6.7, uh, I mean. That was the first version where I introduced a bug. Uh, I had just started at the company and kind of for reference, if you don't count in that way, that was a little bit over 12 years ago. Uh, I just started at the company, kind of my exercise to get started. I added a small new feature and well, that was set six, seven beta one that we released that in. Uh, didn't take many days, they come a bug report. I looked at it like, uh oh. <laughs> uh, I went to my boss, he was then VP of R&D. Uh, I said, uh, you maybe saw that bug report, I, I, I think I, I did it maybe, and, and he just kind of looked at me, smiled, and said, well, that's good. What? Y you know, we got this regression, uh, regression test, kind of automated things and so on. You just found a way of improving it. Well, there we go. I have been helping improving regression test suits ever since then. Uh, today, or right now, we're going to take talk about some news about kind of what we've been up to and 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 what we'll be doing next uh, no next year not, but remainder of this year basically before we get into that let's talk a little bit about release models uh, because that's one of those weird things that we think about at Vardin so what, what what that really means is I mean one is kind of how do we release things but more important maybe is how do you use that how does it impact you when we release something? Uh, and even more specifically, because that's what everyone keeps asking about, is this still maintained? How long will it be maintained? Well, wh what are our options there? So uh, when, we, when we talk about maintaining things that we have released, the thing is every year, in the past years at least, we release over 100 new versions. We can't maintain all of them forever. That's just not sustainable. So kind of, we actually, we are at maintaining nine branches right now. And probably, I mean, if I talk with you, that's not enough. If I talk with the engineers back, back at headquarters, they say, oh, that's way too much. We can't cope with it and so on. So we kind of, we need to find some balance here. What do I mean when I say that we maintain those branches? I mean, there's, there's a couple of things. First is uh, when there's some catastrophic thing, it needs to be fixed immediately. Security issue, new web browser update that breaks everything. It doesn't happen often, but it has happened. When those things happen, then you want to have the kind of know that if I'm just using this and that version, then I will get that patch very, very quickly. Just a simple update to install and, and then I'm good to go. So, so that's the first aspect of it. Then we got the warranty service, uh, which is uh, for, for, for paying customers that they can say that, hey, this issue is, is extra important for us. So please prioritize it over kind of what, what, what you would otherwise be doing. And those also kind of, when you're on maintained version, then it's automatically covered by, by, by the warranty service. Otherwise we might discuss, but, but kind of, the guarantees technically are, are, are for those maintained versions. And then finally, of course, we are also doing other things based on community feedback, based on pull requests that we got and, and all those kinds of things. Those also then kind of go out, out to those maintained versions by default. Mm. We got three different kinds of releases that we're doing. Uh, first one is the humble maintenance release. So that's when the kind of last digit in the version number changes. So for instance, 24.1.7, kind of replaced 24.1.6. Uh, 
these only ever contain bug fixes that are supposed to be completely safe to just take into use. No, no kind of risk of causing regressions or anything like that. So if you trust us, then you just take it straight to production. Maybe you want to do some testing before because, I mean, it's software we're talking about, but, but still, they, they should be really, really trivial to take into use. The way we work is uh, we do all our changes to our main branch, also bug fixes. And then once per week, we see kind of mm, what have changed, which things should we be picked to, to which maintenance version, uh, version branches. And then based on that, we actually make those releases. We don't pick everything to all versions necessarily, because if it's just a kind of a small bug fix or something, then it's maybe just as good to kind of keep it in the latest versions to avoid because people who use those older versions that are still maintained, usually they use them because they don't want to have so frequent updates. So we kind of try to keep, keep the pace a little bit slower there and only, only fix the most more urgent things there and then kind of the, the latest versions get more frequent updates. Then we got minor releases. So that's when the middle number changes. So for instance, from 24.0 to 24.1. These are where we introduce new features. These are also built on the same main branch as the bug fixes, but we're not picking them to all the other branches. Instead, uh, once per quarter, we branch out a new, new maintenance branch. That includes everything that was ready by that time. If we got things that weren't ready that we're not certain about, we put a preview or oh, feature flag in front of that basically. You can try this out, but do it at your own risk. We might still change things. We might realize that kind of design the requirements have been wrong. We might realize that there are some things in the implementation that make sense or something, but it's still something you can try out because it's there in the version, but again, behind that flag. Mm, these typically, it's still easy upgrades, but I mean, we have been adding things. We have been making maybe a little bit more kind of not super, super, super careful, just careful, which means that probably you want to actually test things from time to time. We might even make some small adjustments that need like changing a default configuration if you realize that the old one was terrible or, or things like that. So you might need, need to do some small code changes also, but nothing big. The thought here is that these should be easy enough to adopt that when we release one minor version, then the previous one will remain maintained for three months. So basically from your point of view, you got three months of time to make that update if you still want to be on a maintained version, a version that, that receives those security updates and so on. Finally, that's not always possible to make things easy to upgrade to. Every now and then we need to change something more fundamental. We, we might update kind of what's the minimum required Java version. We might have some old feature that no longer is sustainable. We kind of, we realize this isn't good to maintain for the upcoming 15 years. So if sooner or later, it, it just has to go. So wh when we are in that position, uh, then we do a major release. So that's when the first number changes. So for instance, from Vardin 23 to Vardin 24. These, uh, we, we aim at doing these kind of once every one to two years. We don't have a fixed schedule. When it happens, when we are at that point, uh, it replaces the regular quarterly minor release. So it, it follows the same cadence in that way. And when we release those, we got kind of the open source maintenance continues for the previous ma major version, continues for one year. So, so you got that time to update. Uh, there's also commercial options for sticking to it longer, but here we also want to really encourage people to keep updating because uh, at the end of the day, it's kind of the same amount of effort to stay up to date. No, regardless if you do kind of one really big, big update once per 10 years, or if you just continuously keep doing it. So the benefit of doing it continuously is, is that you got many smaller projects instead of one huge, huge project. That means that you can't do anything else for, I don't know, a month or a year or depending on, on how long you waited. So we really want to encourage people to keep updating to these new mi uh, major versions 
as quickly as possible within a year. But we also realize that that's not always feasible. So there are also op options available. Here's a very dense slide with all the versions that we're currently maintaining. So we got kind of at the top. It's the main branch that will soon become Vardin 24.3. Uh, in December, uh, and then we got a couple of kind of mm, minor branches, 24.2, 24.1, that are still maintained, and then we got all the older majors that are that are uh, under maintenance. Different circumstances, some are open source maintained, some are only for Prime Plus, so that's people, uh, customers with a Prime Enterprise or uh, Ultimate subscription, they have access to those, and then also the really old ones, extended maintenance. So that's then a, a separate option that, that, that you can, can get from us. So what I've described now, that's kind of, that's how we operate. But then the question comes, what does that mean for you? What, what do you need to do? So what do you need to do to get bug fixes? First thing is you need to upgrade. When there's a new minor version for the major that you're using, you need to upgrade within three months. Second, when there's a new major, you got three options. You got open source option, upgrade within one year. We got the prime plus option, which is that you can keep using the major version for five years after it was uh, initially released. Or then we got the extended maintenance option, which goes for 15 years. And again, if you ask our engineers, 15 years is really, really scary. <laughs> yep. But we, we, we kind of, we believe we can do it. We, 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 we haven't gone to 15 years with any version so far, but it, it seems feasible and, and we, we, we stand to that commitment. Finally, there's also one more option, which is we got a custom build service, which means that we can maintain a private branch for you. So any version, you can remain on that for as long as you want. We can pick whatever fixes you, you want to it. Of course, all the security fixes and so on, other, other fixes that you think are important for you. And then we build that through the same infrastructure with the same mechanism that we use for the, for the official releases also. So, that was about feature, uh, bug fixes, then how you get new features. That's very, very easy. Just use the latest version. Like I already uh, described, kind of those users who are on a later or older version, they don't want to have all those new features typically because they, they want to have stability. They don't, don't want to keep retesting things. They don't want to, I mean, many companies have some kind of process that they need to go through if they install anything except maintenance updates and so on. And because it's not feasible for us to keep maintaining all of those old versions, when we, if, if we would add features to older versions, it means basically that all people who use those, they would have to upgrade unless they use the custom build service again. But still, we're not impossible. If there's some new feature that you think is really, really important for you, Talk with us, we can see what would be the option, best option. Maybe we can introduce it as a separate add-on. Maybe we can actually add it if it's contained enough that it won't cause any risks. Maybe we, 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 we have options to, to do there, but, but still kind of, you need to talk with us. We can come, up, come, come to some good solution, but don't expect us to add all the new features to all the old versions. That's about how we release things. Now, what have we actually been released and, and what will we be releasing? So uh, I'm basically, I'm picking a bunch of highlights from, from this year. What we've done and what we still have in the pipeline for the, basically we, we have one more quarter to release in, in December. So, so we're already working all, on all the things that should go there. Uh, I'm not going to go through all the things we have released because that would be a quite long and quite boring list because there's just so many things. But instead, I'm picking some highlights from, from different kind of categories. Before we go there, reminder, Jonas already showed this, but from a slightly different perspective, 
We got this thing called Flow, we got this thing called Hilla. They are therefore building the same kinds of applications. They both, the core frameworks are with the same open source license. It's the same kind of full stack philosophy. How can we empower a team that has front end and that back end development kind of actually fitted together? Both solutions, they use the same UI components. With both frameworks, you have the same kind of whatever Java backend you want to integrate with. If it's got a Java API, that backend thing like Quarkus, uh, Quarkus integration or Kafka or whatever you got, you can use it in the same way regala regardless of the framework. The difference is there in the middle. So with Flow, all the client side stuff, that's a client engine that is part of the framework. You just write server-side Java code and that's it. Whereas with Hilla, you got the UI logic that runs in the browser. You implement it using TypeScript and React, for instance. And then you also have another ar architectural layer, the backend access layer that you uh, use to actually get data from, from your business logic on the backend in, 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 into the code that runs in the browser. But anyways, kind of, lots of things are the same, a couple of things in the middle, and most of the things I'm showing here, they apply just as well to both Flow and Hill, and I will try to point out when they, when they don't. Also, uh, like mentioned, there's a round table discussion tomorrow uh, afternoon where we'll also kind of discuss Flow and Hill and, and, and what's up with those. The categories, because like I said, I, I'm going to highlight things from a couple of different categories based on how, how we see that we, we empower you, the, the, the different kind of ways that, that we, we help you build, build great applications. So one thing is longevity. Basically, again, 15 years. What, what are we doing to be able to do that? How can we support you? I mean, for instance, uh, uh, Ben will talk about some tips for, for how you keep your application modern later today. Uh, that's one example of that. But it's also, for instance, just being open source is an example of that because then you, have, then you have insurance that no matter what happens, you still can keep using the product. Uh, then we got enterprise UX. So this is, I mean, I guess most of you are building enterprise applications, business applications, applications that people use for work, not applications that people use on their own time. Uh, and lots of things out in the world about how should I build web applications. It comes again, like, like Jonas also mentioned, it comes from Google, Facebook, and, and, and those kinds of companies. They build consumer stuff. And there's some subtle differences, like for instance, when we talk about enterprise applications, quite often it's the person you using it sits at their desk for a whole day using that application. If you talk about these consumer things like Netflix, you kind of flick through the list, you pick something, then you just watch it, but you don't interact with the application for a long time. So that's just one example of how things are, are different between consumer UX and enterprise UX. Finally, last uh, category and maybe the most important one for us is developer productivity. We, we try, we want to make you as productive as possible and, and we're going to see a whole bunch of examples of, of what we're, we've been doing and at what we will be doing to help with exactly that. So that longevity. Mm, first thing is we, uh, in Vardin24, released uh, in uh, March this year, we went to a new updated technology baseline. So we kind of, followed the lead from, from some other people in the ecosystem also, basically saying that as of this, we we're gonna put Java 17 as the uh, minimum Java version we support. We're gonna put Jakarta EE 10 as the baseline, so that's a uh, minimum requirement there. Uh, if you're using Spring, then it's Spring fr Framework 6 and Spring Boot uh, 3. There are kind of the, the minimum versions if you want to use all the, all the versions of any of these technologies, then of course you can do that because Vardin 23 is supported for a long time, Vardin 14 and so on. Uh, but again, to get the latest features, we, we just kind of move uh, onwards. 
Uh, finally also, yeah, JUnit 5 also supported now in, in Testbench, but there we can actually keep both working side by side, where, whereas for instance the Jakarta EE10 thing, it's just not compatible with the older versions in any way because the namespace changed. That also brings to mind one thing, when we introduce, so to say, breaking changes, whenever feasible, we try to do it in a way that we actually introduce a replacement in a previous version, we deprecate the old, old thing, and then you, you can use them side by side, you can gradually update, <coughs> so you don't have to do everything on the day when you change the version number. That's not always possible. For instance, with this Jakarta EE10, because lots of API names, or not names, but the, the package names changed in the underlying technology, so that wasn't feasible. But in, in very many cases, that, that's what we try to do. Next thing on the longevity team is certifications. So there's kind of two sides to this. One is I want to show that I'm a really good Java developer, uh, Vardin developer I mean. That's not kind of so much to do with longevity, but when you look at it from an employer's point of view, how can I find Vardin developers to hire? Then that's something that is very important for kind of having a application that runs for a long time. So we used to have certifications a while ago and now we're getting them back again. So actually, as of today, it was launched on the website. You can go there and try out the new certification exam and there's two different levels. You can try to become a certified developer, Vardin developer or a certified professional, which is uh, kind of a higher level there. To support this, we are also launching, unfortunately it's not out yet, but stay tuned later this week. We are uh, launching a new uh, round of videos to guide you through what are all the things you need to know to, to be able to use Vardin 24 uh, efficiently. Of course, all of this is also in the documentation, but also having those videos kind of walk you through it in, in more kind of step-by-step -step format is, is really, really useful. Final, last, third thing on the longevity track I want to mention is something we call AppSec Kit, so Application Security Kit. This is uh, an add-on that you can add to your Vardin application uh, and what it does is it scans your dependencies when you run the application in development mode. And based on that, it can see that, hmm, this dependence actually needs updating because like we have seen, supply chain security is, it's really becoming a thing. And, and with, with this AppSec kit, uh, I mean, there's lots of great solutions out there already for the same kind of problem. They are usually based on integrating with your build environment. So that wh when you build the software, then it says that, oh, you got an old dependency. What we tr <coughs> try to do here is to shift that to the left. So immediately already when you're developing before you have even committed anything, then you can also get the same thing. Uh, in addition to that, we also, because I mean, we know what dependencies we introduce to your applications. So quite often, even if there's a vulnerability in one of them, it doesn't affect the way Vardin uses that dependency. So we also kind of introduce here our own assessments. We can say that if you're just using it built into Vardin, but you're not kind of using this, this library on your own, then this vulnerability might not be an issue for you. So in that way, you can be more certain that is this, I mean, you, sh you should always upgrade eventually, but is it something you need to do right away today? Or is it something that you can schedule kind of next week or, or next month or something like that? Next theme, enterprise UX. So again, we got these things about how do you build the UI for business web applications. Uh, we got one very, very big thing on this theme that we've been doing lots about, we keep doing, I mean, we got people working on it right now, is how do I theme the, my application? How do I kind of do the layouts of things and so on? Because we run community surveys we have one, I don't know, was it closed already, but already preliminary results that I looked at last week. 
the most popular thing on your feedback about what's, what's, what's struggling for you, what are the things we should improve. That's exactly on theming and so on. So like Jonas already mentioned, we got a session tomorrow with uh, Rolf and Yusa who will go through how should you use the latest Vadim features to structure your theming, make it easy to make the components behave the way you want and so on. Uh, definitely recommend looking at that one. I won't go further into that now. Instead, my first pick for kind of things that we have improved is grid performance. So it's maybe a little bit small here, but the point is uh, with grid and free grid, we took eight different quite common use cases. <coughs> we uh, benchmark those, really see kind of what's, what's the performance right now. And then we saw how can we improve them. So out of those use cases, just by optimizing what we already have, we improved performance by between 10 and 80%. So some of those were almost twice as fast as they used to be. Uh, then we saw that, well, we can do better, right? Uh, the problem is that we can do better, but it's got some drawbacks. So we also added an optional lazy column rendering mode. What that means is that when you got a grid with lots and lots of columns, not all of those are visible at the same time. So what if we just ignore the columns that are not visible? That means that the grid is terrible for anyone using a screen reader. It means that it's terrible if you try to, in your browser, search for something that isn't on the visible kind of view. But at the same time, we can speed things up even more because there's just less data to actually process at any given time. So when you enable the uh, lazy column rendering mode, then we actually, the worst use case is only 50% faster, whereas the best one actually got to almost 90, but uh, uh, almost 100, but I, I say 90% faster. All of these changes, they landed already in Vardin 24.1 in uh, June. So they are really kind of ready to be used and and definitely one big benefit that you get from upgrading. Another thing, accessibility. I mean, it's always, it's always good to be in Germany because the Germans, they are really forerunners in the field of accessibility. They have for long had le legislation in the public sector that everything needs to be accessible and they are quite much the ones who have been driving now EU legislation that also expands that to a bunch of other kind of private run, but kind of general public facing things like for instance, banking and retail. Quite soon we will also have legislation that says that all of those things must be accessible by law. And uh, we run uh, every year, we run uh, with an external uh, consultancy. They are really experts in just assessing and improving accessibility. So they review all our components and point out things that could be improved and so on. And then we gradually keep, keep improving things. And, and this year we've done a lot of kind of things for, for individual components, but also I'm picking here three examples that go through all the component set. First one is uh, Java APIs for adding uh, ARIA labels to lots of components. So these are the kind of texts that screen readers read out for you, for instance, when, 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 a, when, when highlighting that component or just when kind of telling you what's on the screen. So now you have an easier way of, of controlling those. Uh, then actually by default, lower left corner there, by default our components, they do not fulfill the more strict requirements for uh, contrast ratios. We're introducing an optional mode for actually adding borders around, for instance, the input fields and so on. And with that, if, if you enable that option, then you will be able to, to also fulfill those criteria with just the built-in theming. Finally, uh, there's this thing in operating systems nowadays called high contrast mode. And we looked at what all our components look like if the user has enabled that and made sure that, I mean, it's, it's maybe not the prettiest thing because it's basically just black and white, but still we, we made lots of improvements for, for what the components look like when users have enabled this. 
then a whole bunch of other component features, but uh, I'm actually going to show those kind of, oops, uh, show those live to you instead of just some boring slides. So that's not what we should be looking at. We should be looking at this thing. Yep, no, actually that's not. So we got a whole bunch of, there we go, whole bunch of new components. These are straight from the documentation, so you can have a look at these yourself also. The first one I'm showing is a side nav or side navigation component. Uh, because every application, or well, not every, but almost every application, I present myself an, as an architect, so I am allowed to simplify things. Every application <laughs> has this kind of menu, usually on the, on, on the, the left-hand side, with kind of all the things you can go to. And we realized that we should probably create a component to help building this, because we have, in our own examples, we have had lots, lots of custom code for doing that, and and seen lots of examples from you also. So, I mean, you can have this list, you can have icons on it, you can put things in front or kind of as prefix or suffixes, so if counts or alerts or these kinds of things. You can have a hierarchy, so uh, expanding things here. You can also have kind of hierarchy with, with a label rather than the, that thing being uh, navigatable to and so on. Next component I'm going to show you is with icons. So this is kind of existing, kind of new. Uh, we're also now in 24.2, released just last week. Uh, we are introducing helpers for also using third-party icons. So I mean, you have always had the built-in Vardin and Luma icons, but now you can also use basically any SVG file you have. You can use that as an icon very easily. If you got an SVG sprite, so that's kind of one SVG file that cons contains lots of different symbols, then you can also with uh, just kind of one line of code say that, oh, let's pick the user symbol from this uh, solid.svg sp uh, sprite set. Also icon fonts, so this is for instance uh, what how font awesome is usually uh, distributed. So again, there's a couple of different ways of using these you need to put the CSS somewhere, you need to put the font somewhere, but then from your Java code or from your TypeScript code, you can really easily just reference these to again, have any kind of, of third party icon there. Then we got the login component. Let's see if I find that in the list. It's on L probably, yep. So there, this is also an existing component. <coughs> what we're adding, adding here is header, uh, no, custom form areas, so we got, there we got it, we got a slot in the middle of a component where you can now customize it by adding your own, whatever you want. If it's an input field, then it also gets submitted when, when the user clicks log in, but you can also put other things there if you want to have some notices or anything. Uh, also a footer area, so that's kind of below the, below the buttons and so on. So you can also, again, I mean, this is just creating, creating the login, creating this text that we want to put there and then just add it to the footer area. So it's really, really easy to, to get things added uh, to those two different parts of the login component. Then next up on my list is the map component. This is also an existing old component. Well, not old, old, but existing component. <coughs> what we have been adding there is a feature for actually customizing the markers. So you can put different fonts, different text colors, all those kinds of things, and also drag and drop for the markers. You can drag, take a marker and put it there. And then actually from Java code, you can, for instance, show a notification about where that marker was, was dropped now. Mm. Final component that I'm going to show that we have been making bigger updates to earlier this year is spreadsheet. So in the spreadsheet, we now also have chart support <coughs> in, in the Vardin uh, 23, 24 versions. <coughs> so 
this used to be in the Vardin 8 version. So now here we, we got this chart embedded in the spreadsheet and it's live updated. So if I change this, we immediately see also that the, the bar changes. And if I, if I click on some data, then it actually also on the spreadsheet side highlights which, which parts o of the data I is covered there. Those were the component updates. So enterprise UX, and as I said, right now the, the team is working on further improvements to how you structure your teams to, to make it even easier based on, based on feedback that, that we have gotten from you. Mm. Next out, we got the topic of developer productivity. So this is very much about the development framework. So flow and hill and, and, and improvements we've been doing there. First, I'm going to show something that is kind of neither of them, or well, it's built into Flow, but it's quite separate. Actually, could also mention the view builder in startvadin.com that, that Jonas already showed. That's also a new thing. But we also have actually embedded inside the application in, the, in dev mode, we got this uh, theme editor. So you can just pick any component, like for instance, this, oops, what's going on there? Maybe I need to refresh. Theme editor, pick an element. Ah, now it works, great. That's always the fun thing with demoing things. So, um, theme editor, you can pick any component. You can choose, do I want to change the theming for just this particular component instance or all the components in the application? Let's just edit this one right now. And then you got a whole bunch of things like let's Let's take this text field and let's give it a border, one pixel, great. Let's give it a border radius, eight pixels, so that then it's kind of more rounded. Let's take, let's take the label, font size, increase it a bit, yeah, and let's make it bold also. So now it's really pretty, isn't it? <laughs> thank you, thank you. I mean, th there's a reason we got UI designers here also. You, you should talk with them about how to really make it great. Uh, but the interesting thing here is, uh, Actually, this generates behind, behind the scenes, it generates all the CSS for you. It puts it in a separate file so you know what, what are the things that, that you actually have created and what are the things that the tool created for you. Uh, and even more in interesting is that because I edited this text field and we also, in most cases, this isn't foolproof, but in most cases we can find where in the code have you defined this component? Because to, to a, be able to target styles at that particular component instance, we need to add, for instance, a CSS class name to it. So actually this theme editor, it finds that for, for you, adds that class name, writes out the CSS using that class name. So like you see here, it actually, it's text field dot hello world text field one <laughs> is, is the class name of that thing and that also gets automatically injected in, into your Java code in the appropriate places in most cases. If you encounter a case when it doesn't work, then let us know. Some of those are actually impossible to fix, but I'm very certain there are also cases that, that just need a little bit of tuning on our side to be able to locate the, the actual right place of, 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 of editing things. Next, we got Hilla. So, I mean, this is also, I got a Flow application and a Hill application. Before I styled them, they looked exactly the same. That's the whole point. It's the same kind of applications you, you can build with them. But this is the Hill application. One thing uh, we've been doing there is adding more React support, like Jonas already described, kind of. Yeah, we started with Lit, but React is a bit more popular. Uh, so for, for instance, now we have also added uh, field, uh, form binding support here. So here in this very simple form, if I do something, we get here now client side validation based on Java type. So we already had that. Well, you got that in, in flow with the binder there and you had it with the lit binder, but now it's also in the, in the React binder. So actually the code for this, I mean, again, full stack thinking, 
Here we got this field, oops, uh, for instance, the first name field, and the whole point is that to bind that, you have something, there's no magic strings here, so I can actually just kind of get auto-completion in my TypeScript code for doing form binding based on a Java type. If I would change the name of that property in the Java DTO, then I would get a compile error in my TypeScript immediately saying that, oh, this is the place I need to make updates also. So this is an example of how, how we make things much more productive with uh, for kind of full stack teams. Another thing we've been building is um, something we call auto grid. So basically the same kind of thinking. We got based on your Java types, we got metadata in TypeScript about what's in this type. So what if we could use that also for configuring a grid? I mean, you probably want to customize it further, but it's a really good starting point. So in this example, I've got a person service class. It's very, very simple because I'm just extending CRUD repository service, giving it a, a spring, spring data repository. And that's all it takes in this simple case to make, make this, all these CRUD operations available to the client side. Based on this, I can go for instance to the hello world view. So that's this view. Yep. Uh, and no, that's the flow hello world, hello hello world. Uh, so here I can just remove what we got and then I can add an auto grid. I need to give, oops, caps lock. I need to give it a model. So this is the metadata uh, and this is generated based on the Java types. Uh, and then I need to give it, um, what's it called? Help. It's called a uh, service maybe. Yes, it's called a service and that's then the person service kind of uh, endpoint that we, or not endpoint, but browser callable service that we defined. So with just these few lines of code, why doesn't it auto re refresh? But here we have now configured a grid based on, based on the metadata here. So we got, we got sorting, we got filtering and so on. Just one line of code. Of course you want to customize it, but that's the next step because now you already have saved yourself 30 minutes of coding. Next step there is that we're working on right now is to take the same thinking also for the rest of CRUDs. So we've got an auto, gr gr auto grid and an auto form where the fields in the form are again generated based on the same metadata and then put those together inside an auto CRUD that Basically, when you select something in the grid, it populates the form and, and all of those things. And we're a little bit trying to figure out how to make all of that configurable also, but, but we're making good progress there also. Finally, last framework that we got. So flow, good old flow, like probably most of you are using today. Most of you will keep using it also. Like said, kind of, all the component improvements, all those kinds of things, they apply just as much for Hilla usage as for flow usage, but we have also been making some improvements in the actual framework. Uh, main focus this year has been on speeding things up, kind of just launching the project. So ba back in previous versions, when you actually started things, so if you, if I now rerun this, it's, up and running in just a couple of seconds because we no longer, as long as you're not using any custom add-ons, custom components, anything like that, we don't need to even download any front-end dependencies. We have bundled everything that is included in the core framework. We have bundled into a pre-made JavaScript bundle. So we can just run everything from that as long as you're using the defaults, which means that if you just download a new project from start.vaden.com, you're ready to go immediately. No, no need to wait for it to launch and download everything into node modules and so on. Not even needing to wait for bit or webpack to, to launch, but just a couple of seconds basically. This also carries over to production mode. So again, if, if you're just using the built-in components, then the production build can also be very, very quick because again, it doesn't need to go through those steps. We've got a separate production bundle there also. 
you can still optimize things if you want. So uh, actually it also now we added a way of splitting things up so that it only loads the front end dependencies for the view that, that you're actually looking at. So if you're using, for instance, I mean Vardin charts, it adds a couple of hundreds of kilobytes of JavaScript that needs to be downloaded. If you got charts on only one view, then by default, it's only users who open that view that actually will need to download the charts library or the JavaScript for it. Then of course, if you got, you got your own, maybe you got some add-ons from directory, maybe you have built your own front end logic and something like, or, or, or like that. So then of course it still needs to be compiled actually to run in the browser. So for that, there's two different modes. By default, whenever something has changed, it builds a new development bundle. You can commit that one. So all, everyone else in your team, they don't need to actually download, module, do, download node modules and so on, but instead just run it right away. Or if you're kind of actively changing things all the time, then maybe you want to just change the con configuration option to keep using things in, in the way it used to work. Yes? That was the live things I wanted to show. Let's see if I can find myself back to the slides. There we got some slides for me. Actually, we're not there yet, we're there. Uh, so the final thing we, we, we did for Flow uh, is faster redeploys. I actually talked with one, one, uh, one of you guys just uh, this morning and, and this, this was kind of, this was really something that, that that person had noticed. So we we took a look at what happens kind of when I make a code change, save the Java file, it needs to kind of restart a whole bunch of things. How can we make that faster? So we went from, for a small, sim simplest possible flow application, we went from 3.2 seconds to 1.2 seconds. So that's, that's again kind of, it's really, really noticeable when you are editing things. Of course, we recommend that you use JRebel or, or HotSwap agent because then it's instant. But even if you're not doing that, and it seems quite many haven't discovered those great tools, really recommend them, check them out. But even if you haven't done that, then it's, it's now significantly faster to actually get that small incremental redeploy to get the new features in. Those were lots of things I'm gonna summarize in a while, but in between, if there's any questions, then this would be a, an excellent time for those. You shouldn't, yeah? Are the, the slides, are they available? Will it be available? We will, yes, we will, we will be publishing the slides somehow. I don't know exactly how, but I, I'm sure they will be. Uh, any other questions? I mean, you, you can't make me believe that I was explaining everything so clearly that nothing, yeah, yeah I saw Pete. Uh, <laughs> everything was so clear that I don't need to describe anything again, but yeah, Pete? So on the developer certification, what's the time investment kind of outline? I know it's self-study, but any idea on what the ROI times on those are? Sami? Sami is not in the room. No, Sami is there, he's just hiding. I don't know. <laughs> uh, I think, uh, how, how long are the videos that, that we're publishing all together? Three hours per video. 20, 20 to 30 hours is, is, is mm. I, I, if you st I if you, st like yeah. 
before and see the bombings of the war, actually I had to go to much, much deeper into uh, somebody who taught me some of this stuff. Yep. I'm, I'm guessing that you can do it even in the day if you are very interested in studying about it. Yeah, I guess so. Yeah. <laughs> hey, you got a question? Yeah, so two working days, that's 15 hours. Yeah. Okay, any other questions? Yeah. Yes, um, you mentioned that not so many people taught autochrome, so can you maybe elaborate on what the basis for this is? <coughs> Autoform, so that's for Hilla. Uh, it's in the stage that we have something that works for the simple use cases. We are trying to understand how to make it work also for the more complex use cases. We are confident that we will have something something shipped uh, within this year, definitely. Probably already kind of November-ish, but no promises there. Okay, but only the Russian one. Oh yeah, that, that, that's for Hilla. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, I was thinking back, we had in Vardin 6 and 7, we had something similar also on the Java only side, but uh, there were some architectural struggles there and so on. So I was running through my head kind of, could we also now use the same hill approach for this? But that needs a little bit more thought. Right. All right. All right, I don't see any more questions right now. You can also ask at any other time, but uh, yep. So let's recap. First, we talked about the release model, kind of how do you, how do you stay up to date? This is just a different representation of the same thing. We got kind of, when we, the lifespan of a major version, first one to two years, it's the latest version. Then it's the previous version, but open source main maintenance for one more year. Then up until the fifth year, it's in Prime Plus maintenance. So for Prime Enterprise and Ultimate subscribers, and then all the way until those scary 15 years, that's the extended maintenance. And then the thing is that we kind of, there's always a newer version before the previous one no longer maintained which means that we're gonna do kind of these one after the other after the other. So, so eventually we will have kind of, I think we will have 10 major versions maybe in, in maintenance. I mean, that's quite close to the 10, uh, nine maintenance branches we got right, right now also. Then we walked through a whole bunch of <coughs> what's, what's been done recently and what's coming the remainder of the year. We talked about longevity updated tech baseline with uh, Java 17 and so on. We got the new certifications to help you show how good you are with Vardin and also to help people find you. We got the AppSec kit to, to get supply chain security handled in a really early phase of development and really, really easy to start, start using it. We got grid performance improvements on the UX side. We got the accessibility improvements like area labels and, and so on. We got a bunch of new UI components like the side nav, the third party icons and so on. Productivity, new tooling, the visual view builder that Jonas showed, theme editor that I showed, 
Hela, we got React, support, uh, React forms, we got auto grid, we're going to get uh, auto forms and flow. Lots of improvements speeding up the development workflow. Uh, I forgot to mention then that right now the flow development team, they are working at a lots and lots of small improvements, highly voted GitHub issues and so on. So probably lots of those things will also something that you get, get a benefit from, but all of them are kind of just smaller things that just kind of the sum of all things is great. That's it. Unfortunately, we won't have lunch for another five minutes. <laughs> Thank you.